Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Welcome back, wildlings. Now, I understand the need to know the truth of things. The urge to power through obstacles to find that golden nugget of fact that makes all of it make sense. Only, you know what kind of story this is, and you know that that golden nugget of truth is as likely to poison you as to set you free. Funny thing, consequences. Continuing on tonight, part two of Butcher Face by Dash 32. Hey, sorry for the long delay. I've been busy with some interesting stuff that I'll actually get into later. Just like the first, this will be long. Now, back to the story. About two weeks after we found the Butcher Face tapes, we were getting tired with having to lug the VCR up and down those steep attic steps because Chris's father, for some reason, kept asking us to put it back up there when we weren't using it. When Chris's younger brother, let's call him Evan, who was going to college for media production, came into the middle of a conversation about this and mentioned that he could convert the tapes to DVD using the equipment at his college. After some haggling and way too much negotiating, that if we, being newly 21 at the time, would pay for the liquor bill for a party that friends of Evan's were having, who were 19 at the time, he'd do it the next day. When that day came, both Chris and I were waiting anxiously in the kitchen for when Evan got home. When he finally did walk in the door, an hour later than he said he'd be back, he was looking extremely pale. We asked him if he was done converting, and he jumped in our faces saying that we never told him what was on the tapes. Apparently, he didn't actually hear what we were talking about and only heard that we wanted some tapes converted and he thought they were more like old family recordings, like uh, Christmas or birthday videos. We calmed him down and asked him if he converted the tapes. He said no, and quickly left the room. We were disappointed, and we started talking about what to do next when Evan came back into the room with his father behind him. After talking about what was on the tapes, Evan retrieved them from his car and the four of us watched every one of the 24 tapes together. After the last one was finished, this is it, this is it, they won't know, they'll never find me, this is where I'll hide. Chris's father's face was just as pale as Evan's was earlier. He leaned back in his chair and said, that was creepy. An hour of talking that night ended with us wanting to know who it was on those tapes. I left for home soon after with the understanding that I would be kept in the loop on what we would do next, which was to figure out the previous owners of the house. A couple days later from there, I got a phone call from Chris saying that it took them a little while. They found nothing on the county website but they found some history on the house at the town library, uh, something called a reverse directory, about a previous owner who had had it in the mid-80s. After a few unanswered phone calls, we decided to visit these people in person. So that Friday, me, Chris, and his father drove to their house and knocked on the door only to be greeted by two 80-something-year-old women. Uh, Chris's father told them that his family was living in their old house and asked if we could ask them some questions about it. They refused to let us in their house, but they did tell us about the one we were living in. It turned out that they were sisters, their first names were Shirley and Louise, and Louise actually turned out to be the former owner of the house in question, but had never lived in it. Apparently, she and her husband bought the house and were planning to add some new wiring and plumbing before moving in, but her husband had had a severe stroke not too long after buying it and eventually died. 
with the combination of hospital and funerary bills, Louise couldn't afford fixing up and moving into the house and moved in with her sister instead. But she did mention that during that time, the house was known to be a home to a fair number of homeless people who would be regularly chased off the property. We also asked if either of them had a son. They both said no. We left there with not as many answers as we'd wanted. A couple weeks later from there, Chris and I had gone to the movies with his girlfriend. I think he was trying to get his mind off the tapes because I could tell that he was still creeped out. Um, we were talking about how much the movie had sucked, Spider-Man 3 if you're interested. When Chris slammed on the brakes, we practically skidded about 30 feet and I was choked by my seatbelt and his girlfriend, who wasn't wearing a seatbelt, was almost thrown into the front seat. We started screaming at him, asking him what the hell he was doing when we looked at what he was staring at and saw a house. It looked familiar to me, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I looked back to Chris and he said, that house is on the tapes. Then I remembered one of the houses that Butcherface had watched people come and go from was right there, not 20 feet from us. We knocked on the door, but no one answered, so we decided to come back later. When we got back to his house, I noticed the VCR hooked back up to Chris's TV in his room. I asked him about it, and he said that he had been watching the tapes again for clues. No wonder he was all creeped out. That night, when I got home, I got a phone call from him. He was whispering and said that he thought he saw someone walking around in his backyard. Two days later, that Friday, I agreed to sleep over and see for myself. He was claiming to see glimpses of somebody standing or walking around in his backyard, but it was always too dark to see any detail both of the previous nights. I was set up to sleep on a couch that was on the now reboarded up hole that we first found the tapes in. Very little sleeping actually went on that night because we stayed up in the living room staring out of the sliding glass door to the backyard. We were talking about how we weren't even sure if he actually hurts people when Chris suddenly leans forward and points out the window and says, see, right there. I jump up, I flip the switch to the deck lights, but they wouldn't turn on. So we got flashlights and went out to look. Besides some tree branches blowing in the wind, we found nothing. Around 4 a.m. we decided to get some sleep. I only stayed on the couch a couple hours because I got too cold because I felt a draft that I think was coming in between the boards on the floor. I went home the next afternoon, thinking the night before was a dud, until I got a frantic phone call that night. Someone had broken into Chris's house while they were out. The sliding glass door to the backyard was completely smashed, with broken glass having been thrown all the way across the living room and into the dining room. I drove back there because they wanted me as a witness to seeing a shadow in the backyard. They showed me around and I saw that this person had completely tossed the living room, the dining room, and the kitchen. In the bathroom, the mirror over the medicine cabinet had been smashed and all of the meds in the medicine cabinet were missing. Something else was missing which was a lot more disconcerting as well. Four knives had been removed from the knife holder in the kitchen. I stayed there for about an hour and decided to go home. It was only after I left that I realized that the butcher face tapes were never mentioned to the cops. A little while after I got home, I got another call from Chris saying that they had found the missing knives under blankets of each of the family members' beds. That weekend, Chris and his father decided to look around the house more thoroughly to see if Butcherface had left any other clues to his former presence in the house. I came over to help, and the only room that they said that they had never looked through thoroughly since getting into the house was the attic, so we decided to start there. 
It didn't take long to find anything because almost immediately I came across an old looking trash bag in one of the corners. I picked it up and heard the tinking sound of glass against glass. We brought it downstairs and cut it open and found it was completely full of liquor bottles and used syringes. Using rubber gloves, we removed every object one at a time. It was almost all bottles and syringes and the occasional trash until we got to the bottom. At the bottom of that bag, we found a shoebox. It was stained and worn and we couldn't even see the brand of the shoe that used to be in it. We carefully took it out and removed the top, which seemed to have been glued closed. Inside was a series of papers and photos. The photos were pretty disturbing. One was a close-up of a hand covered in pins, those ones with the long point with the tiny ball of colored plastic on one end. There were so many of them that it looked like a porcupine. Another one had a presumably dead dog lying on the ground. All we could really see of its surroundings was the dirt on the ground. Behind it was too dark. Uh, we assumed that it was dead because it was missing a half of its face. The flesh of the side of the face that was facing the camera was gone, making it look like it was smiling with a lidless eye. There were a lot more pictures, including a cow with blood on its mouth, a very pale looking foot, various 70s and 80s era toys, a collection of knives, a hand and arm painted multiple colors like patchwork, and a close-up of an eyeball. The papers were pretty freaky as well. They were a combination of drawings and writings. Most of the writings were what seemed like a wish list of murder, listing practically every way imaginable how to kill people. Others seemed to be random thoughts, like how he accidentally pissed his pants while at the movies, or how he was an infectious evil and that he'll spread that to his disciples or something. Some of the drawings were pretty similar to the ones seen on some of the tapes on the walls of Chris's old room. Others were more detailed and showed corpses in various states of decay and of some strange creatures. They were humanoid, but they all had a demonic look to them, with many of them shown standing on all fours. One thing that showed up often was a strange symbol. It looked like the letter C with the gap in the C pointing downward, with a V laid on top of it. When we got to the bottom of the box, we found another tape, one that we would never get to watch because it was completely coated in candle wax. Running out of clues, we decided to revisit the old women who had owned the house in the 80s. It had been almost two months since we last visited them, and we grew to realize that their story didn't quite make sense. For instance, Louise claimed to have given up on the house, yet on the tapes we could see that the house had power. Why would they have continued to pay the power bill if she didn't want it, right? Uh, they also mentioned that homeless people had been regularly arrested or chased off the property by the cops, but we never found any records of this. We tried calling them, but just like last time, we got no answer, so we decided to drop by physically again. When we got there, we found the house abandoned. We went next door and asked the neighbors if they knew where the two old ladies that had lived next door had gone. They told us that Louise had died, but they didn't know how, about three weeks earlier, and that Shirley had abruptly packed up and moved away a week later. While Chris's father was talking to the neighbor, Chris pulled me aside and whispered, We're breaking into that house. That same night, we waited until it was late and drove to the old lady's former house. I'd never broken into a house before in my life, and 
Well, we were dressed in stereotypical burglar outfits, black shirt and pants and a black hockey mask. I know, it was stupid. When we got to the house, we were so nervous that we didn't even leave the car for a good 45 minutes. When we felt assured that the neighborhood was asleep, we got out of the car and crept into the backyard and to the back door. We looked into the window on the door, but it was too dark to see anything. I took my shirt off and put it up against the window and gave it a punch, breaking the glass. It felt surprisingly loud, but that could have been because I was so quiet and the neighbors never woke up, so I guess it wasn't really that loud, was it? I reached in through the hole in the glass and unlatched the door, and then we had a whispered fight over who would go in first. It uh, actually came down to a game of rock, paper, and scissors, which I won, so in he went. We crept in, hunched over, and I closed the door behind me, accidentally slamming it, giving Chris a good jump that we couldn't help laughing over. We snuck around the house with our flashlights shining all over the walls. As a side note, I really don't see how much they really would have fixed up Chris's house when they had it because this one looked like crap. The wallpaper was probably older than Chris and I combined. But anyway, we went into the living room and found a huge pile of trash lying in the far corner with a depression in the middle like a person or a large dog had used it as a bed. We went upstairs and found something that connected this house to Chris's house. In one of the bedrooms was a pile of pill bottles. Some of the pill bottles were the ones stolen from Chris's bathroom medicine cabinet. We knew this because some of them had his mother and father's name on them, and one of them was actually Chris's back pain medicine from an injury that had happened a couple of years before and would require surgery. That was all we needed to see. So we booked it back down the stairs and to the door, but when we got to the door, I jumped back, knocking both Chris and I down. On the inside of the back door was that same CV symbol from Butcher Face's notes. After we got back to the car, Chris said something that creeped both of us out. If Butcher Face had been living in that house, he probably hadn't been there because he was staking out Chris's house at the time. Later that week, I visited Chris's house again, and as soon as I walked through the door, I knew that I'd walked into an air of distress. Chris's mother and brother were pacing back and forth in the living room, looking out the window to the backyard. I walked over and asked what was going on, and looked out the window, seeing Chris and his father in the backyard screaming at each other, and behind them was a large bonfire that had burned down to almost nothing more than cinders. Chris's mother said that their dog, Bracket, had gone missing, but didn't say anything else. I opened the now replaced sliding glass door and walked out to meet them. As soon as Chris's father saw me, he got even angrier. Chris met me halfway to the fire and said, I had to tell them that we broke into the house. I asked why, and he said that he thinks that Butcherface took their dog as payment for breaking into his home. I asked what was on the fire, and Chris told me that what his father was burning was Butcherface's notes, photos, and tapes. Everything had been burned to ashes. During this, his father had walked up behind him and said, I'm ending this right now. I'm burning everything so that you guys can't get in any more trouble. As he said this, he continued past us and into the back door of his garage, coming back out with a shovel, adding, and I'm burying the ashes to put this to rest for good, and started digging a hole at the back of his yard close to the woods. Chris pulled me back into the house and started talking about how all this was unfair, how could his father just burn the tapes like that, they were so close to figuring out who Butcherface was, and on and on. Then his mother called for us from upstairs. We went up to where she was, and she pointed out the door to his father, who had stopped digging and was looking into the hole 
that he had dug. We walked outside and crossed to the yard, to the hole that his father was still looking into. When we got there, we realized why he was frozen, because just a couple of feet into the hole, after more digging turned out to be, over 30 skeletons of cats, dogs, and other animals. This was when we began to call him Butcher Face. Well, kids, that is one of the many reasons you don't mess with crazy. You may get the satisfaction of answering your questions, but when it boomerangs not just on you, but on those around you, you've officially screwed up big time. Stay scary, wildlings. Don't break into other people's houses unless you absolutely have to, and make the most of your nights.